You're listening to The Ground Down, a podcast where we sit down with industry leaders and experts to discuss issues that affect the civil engineering industry. This podcast is brought to you by EHRA Engineering. Welcome. We hope that you enjoy the show. Welcome, everybody, to EHRA Engineering's podcast series called The Ground Down. Today, we welcome Peter Barnhart, uh, Executive Vice President and Partner with the Caldwell Companies, and Rich Muller, the founding partner with the Muller Law Group. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for joining us today. How have you guys both been doing, your families and your businesses? How have y'all been faring through these unprecedented times of this national pandemic? Peter, why don't you go ahead and start off? Well, I've, I've had the ability to spend a lot more time with my family over the last two months than I have in a long time. So that's a, that's a real positive. Uh, got my, my oldest home from college and the other, they're learning how to you know, do college online, which is interesting. Um, so hanging in there, um, uh, business is challenging as, as you can well imagine, you know, the highest unemployment rate this, uh, th- this country has ever seen, um, has an impact across our business, uh, as jobs are what drive, you know, household growth and, and housing growth. So, uh, there's some real challenges in that for sure. First, I want to thank you for, for having me on the program. I think this is a great idea what you're doing and, and, uh, Love the forward thinking uh, on doing these podcasts. Uh, yeah, same thing. My family's doing great. Uh, I don't know that my kids will ever go back to a real school again. They really enjoy the online uh, learning. Um, yes, you know, so they're good. And like Peter, we've been spending a lot more time together. And so that's been kind of fun. You know, when you take out all the distractions and all the stuff that we do to keep ourselves busy and just work and come home and spend time with your family, it's kind of nice. Um, so that's been good. Uh, business, I think the jury's still out. Uh, you know, we're kind of a lagging indicator in, in our business because we're we're doing things on the back end of the things that Peter is doing. So, you know, check back with me in six months. I'll let you know how the business is doing. Yeah, we're all learning on the fly. So, right. uh, Peter, you've developed many communities across the region. How has this national pandemic affected your communities? You know, generally, um, for the last, we'll just take a snapshot of the last 60 days, because that's, that's really what, what we've been, um, what the time period we've been dealing with it is, uh, is traffic is down, um, you know, probably as much as 50%. You know, home sales are down probably somewhere in that range. Um, you know, we've got some builders that have done better than that, and maybe down, you know, 20 or 30%. Some are down more than 50%. Um, we're seeing a, um, a, a price point of homes that are selling or on the low range. Um, I think some of the people that are, you know, the higher paid jobs in the region, a lot of the oil and gas jobs in our region, you know, those people are, are nervous right now, so maybe staying at home. Um, but people are adapting, saying all that. You know, the traffic that's out is very qualified. Uh, I've heard repeatedly from our home building team and our home building partners that, you know, if there's traffic out in the community, they're qualified. And so you better, you better tackle them when they come through the door and get them a contract signed. So um, there, is, there is buying activity. Um, the last two to three weeks of March was really rough. Um, the first week of April was not much better. The last few weeks of April, we've seen signs that things are improving. And um, you know, I, think people are, I think people are recognizing that, that we have got a world with the coronavirus in it. And that's not going away anytime soon. As much as we want to hear from the talking heads on TVs that the virus is that the vaccine is going to fix this and all the antivirals, you know, we have got to, um, we've got, they've been talking a lot about flattening the curve uh, of the overload in the hospital systems. And we quite frankly haven't seen that except in the cases in New York, which is tragic to watch. Um, so we've got to st- we've got to focus on flattening a lot of other curves right now, like the unemployment curve, and you know the small business bankruptcy curves. All 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 curves matter. They do, um, mm. and and that's and we've had a heavily focus heavy focus on flattening one curve because we didn't know in the face of this pandemic we didn't know exactly how this was going to play out. We have much more data now, so I think we see how this is going to start to play out. And, and we need to have a heavy focus on flattening other curves and, and, um, and although being very respectful to those people that we need to put a shield around, like my parents and my in-laws, um, who I haven't seen in two months, which is really rough. Um, but those are the people that we need to put a shield around. And, and I see some sensibility you know, coming right now. 
Um, and I hope that continues and I encourage our leaders to, you know, to st take strong positions and realize that our economy is what uh, puts food on the table for all of us and, and provides a livelihood for all of us. So um, it's, uh, but, you know, we're seeing signs of life right now that there were people I think realize that we have got a world with the coronavirus in it. Yeah. And life is going to continue to go on tomorrow and the next day, just as it did the day before and the day before that. So it does. Rich, uh, as a municipal utility district, otherwise known as a, as, as a MUD attorney, uh, you represent many MUDs and are heavily involved with many developments across uh, the region. How have you seen this pandemic affect the, the communities that you, that you work with and in the various different areas that you, that you see developments in here and around Southeast Texas? Yeah, it's really, really interesting because the effect, I think, is not uniform across the, the city, right? Um, you've got regional differences. So the projects that, that we're working on that, uh, you know, feed off of the Med Center, very little change in uh, their pace of development. In fact, you know, you've got some of them that are a, a little bit ahead. Uh, Energy Corridor, completely different story. Um, those things are slowing down. Uh, uh, significantly, and then you know, up north, which is really a surprise, Montgomery County uh, still is uh, uh, doing very well, even though it's got a very oil and gas heavy business space. Uh, I was speaking with uh, uh, the city of Conroe folks yesterday, and they've got a number of projects on the horizon, and none of them have, have been put on hold as far as they know, which is um, you know, kind of remarkable given where we are. Uh, and so you've got some regional differences around the uh, around uh, the city, and then you've got some developer differences. You've got some developers who, uh, you know, are, are just looking at projects or just getting started on projects, and so they're not in the, the active sales uh, cycle yet. They're just starting to get the communities up and running, and they see this as, hey, if, all, if everything is back to, quote, normal, Sometime in late 2021, we want to be ready to with our communities, and so they're not slowing down uh, those developments. Um, and then you've got folks that are, are you know knee deep in their communities, and they're worried about velocity and, and that sort of thing. You see them be a little more cautious and and pull back. So um, I don't think it's a, a, a universal answer to to that question. I think different pockets and different developers are all uh, treating it a little bit differently, which is which is kind of interesting, really. I think, we, I, we, I think we've seen, as we have time and time again, is that uh, in the times of uncertainty, there's a, a, there's a big flight to quality. Right. We saw it in the Great Recession. Um, the, the, the data that we have from the 80s when I wasn't in this business, but you know, a lot of the people that I work with were in the business at that time. The data from the 80s shows that, that um, at, the, at the peak of that, Depression in Houston, um, forty percent, almost fifty, almost fifty percent of the sales were in master plan communities, and so and that rises every time there's uncertainty. So I think the quality developments will continue to grab a more than their fair share of the market, and the other guys will suffer. Well, as I say, uh, and you guys know best than anybody, uh, there's a lot of a lot of protection and security in those NPCs uh, that uh, that you're referring to. So. Because uh, they've got uh, their complete their their complete packages. So, Peter, with the shelter and home order uh, that's been in place, school closures, limited daycare options for the past almost two months, forcing families to alter their routines to a full-on stay-at-home program. Were the amenities that you built for the communities that you've developed sufficient to handle these increased demands of having? basically a whole community at home at the same time for an extended period of time? Um, you know, I, well, some things were just closed. And I, I think in the face of any, you know, pandemic like that, gyms and things like that are probably going to be closed for a certain period of time until we know the extent, you know, to which um, whatever bacteria or virus that we're dealing with at the time may affect the community. But you know, this, the number one amenity in communities and has been forever, for as long as I know they've been keeping stats, is, is uh, walking trails. And I don't, you can't have enough people at home to overwhelm walking trails. In fact, it's been a joy to go out in our neighborhoods. You know, the one I live in personally and, and, and others um, that we've developed and just watch the amount of people out, you know, taking a walk. 
and, you know, husbands and wives holding hands. And, you know, so that's, uh, that puts a smile on your face. And, and the other, the other, the other amenities, I mean, they're fine. They'll get back, they'll get put back to use in a reasonable amount of time. And we'll start going back to the gym and we'll be able to have parties and wedding receptions. And so I don't think there was anything really that we would do differently. Um, except maybe build more walking trails because <laughs> yeah. because they are and, and they're the least expensive quite frankly they're a lot less expensive than these huge clubhouses we, that we build and and uh and lazy rivers that aren't being used right now and pools that aren't being used right now so we'll build more trails so, so then that, that would give that would give some credence to the thought maybe of building some more open air type uh amenities that that everyone can enjoy without risking being it, you know, violating any kind of social distancing. Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I've got, I mean, I've got a, a great example of that. Um, the community I live in, uh, Siena Plantation, there's a huge uh, sports complex. Um, got a number of football fields or multi-use fields, soccer, football, lacrosse, a uh, number of baseball fields and softball fields. Um, and, and, and that district chose not to close down those facilities during uh, stay-at-home order people were using them and, and it was a good release for people and still social distance with those open air facilities. In fact, we had people coming from the woodlands to go play on those fields and, and hang out with their friends. Um, so much so there was such demand, we had to hire additional security to enforce the social distancing and make sure people weren't pay, playing, you know, big football games and that kind of stuff. So, you know, overwhelming demand in this, uh, this time period for those types of facilities. And, um, you know, it, it, to Peter's point earlier, uh, high quality developments get their, their um, a disproportionate share of the, the, the new sales uh, when things go bad and the folks with the better amenities tend to, to win. And so, you know, when, when developers are kind of making that decision between making investments in, in uh, recreational facilities and is this gonna pay off and that sort of thing, uh, this is a pretty good lesson, right? So my suggestion is you sell houses when it's when it's uh, good times, but they turn out to be a really good insurance policy for bad times, right? Um, and so you know if you if you're a developer and you're looking at how do I hedge my risk in a downturn in the future, um, you know this might be one of the things that people look at is folks like like Caldwell who have you know great amenities in Town Lake. Um, you know, it, it, it turns out to be a great sales pitch when it's a great hedge when it's not. And so, uh, you know, maybe the economics and the, the investment decisions on those change a little bit after this. I'd be curious to see how it shakes out. Yeah, I think, I think we can all safely say things are going to be way different moving forward into the future. There's no question about that. So, so. Um, Knowing that this pandemic has forever changed the work from home environment, what do you both see or anticipate as changes to the development of communities for the future to handle increased service use uh, demand by the, by the residents for things like water service, sewer capacity, uh, operator calls, et cetera? Rich, why don't you, why don't you share your thoughts on that since, uh, from the attorney standpoint? Yeah, again, I think that's a, the jury's still out on that one. Um, you know, our entire office has been working remotely uh, since uh, March. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have that capability set up ahead of time, so that was a pretty seamless transition. Uh, as a business owner, um, I will tell you I am, I am pleasantly surprised by how productive our folks are when they're working from home with the tools that, that uh, they've got. Um, and so, you know, the question that everybody's asking is, well, how many people are going to want to keep working from home even after all of this has passed? And how many businesses are going to say, you know what? Turns out that I can I can be uh, very productive and very profitable with people working from home. And so, you know, if you get this sea change to work from home that people uh, are, are thinking might happen as a result of this, uh, it's a game changer for everything, right? You got to reevaluate your water demand. Certainly have to reevaluate your internet and communications demands. Um, trash pickup. I mean, we've had a couple of trash companies who have, who have basically invoked force majeure saying we can't pick up all the trash that's being created in the communities uh, with everybody staying home. And so all that all that changes. And uh, I think it just remains to be seen how much of the stay at home is permanent and how much of it is is temporary. And and 
I know that this time next year we'll have a better sense of that. As, as a developer, one of the things that, that we've got to focus on and have focused on recently is, is, uh, is making sure that we've got the absolute highest quality um, internet communications in our communities. That's probably one of the biggest limitations in, in some of the older communities and quite frankly might drive a lot of, you know, um, sales in newer communities that have that, you know, fiber to the home and those types of things. Um, our businesses are all geared up for that because that's where, you know, all that demand was before. Um, some things will shift like trash service. You know, those, those trash companies might be picking up, you know, more in, in, the, in the neighborhoods and might want to renegotiate that contract. But, you know, at the offices, they're going to be picking up less. So as business owners, we need to be renegotiating th those contracts. Yeah. So there's going to be there's there's going to be some things that are permanent and new, and some of it's just going to be shipped. Um, water and sewer, to the extent that you have a mud district that is that is like largely residential, they would probably have an increase in needs for water and sewer to the extent that it's got some commercial in it. Again, I think it'd just be a shift. Yeah. Yeah. Although that as you know, for, as from an engineering side. You, of course, you design for all these, uh, all these needs and, and and the capacities and whatnot. But but I don't know that anyone's really ever had a full time, full on everyone at home at the same time, yeah. acts in the system and and all of again they're designed for it. It's just I don't know that anyone's ever really truly tested. So I mean, it's really it's, it's going to be a test of 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 how things uh, how things truly operate under these kind of demands because they are ex definitely excessive. So well, we're going to see how good those engineers. Who put all that those uh, safety factors in their in their calculations? Uh, to see how good they are. So it's a challenge for the engineering community, right? There's still going to be too much safety factor on there. You know, <laughs> spoken like a develop, true developer for sure. We've had that conversation many times before. Right. Sometimes right. it helps. Sometimes safety it's factor right. upon safety right. factor. <laughs> right, but you but you're glad you have it now, right, dear? No. Otherwise, you have still so much. Still, there's still a hidden safety factor in there. We right. just don't know where it is. A lot better than sewer flow in the streets. Good job, it. Jim. Good job for you guys. Way if going. anyone can find it, Pete can, that's for sure. Way <laughs> going to do All, right. All right, moving on. How will how will the formation and option of future MUDs be impacted by this national pandemic? Pete, why don't you start off with that? You know, I don't know if that process will change that much. Um, I'll say this. Challenges usually force you as a business owner um, to look for the um, areas where you can save costs. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I've actually talked on some of the districts that he helps us with is, is you know, minimizing meetings, making districts larger. How, how, can, how can we trim operational costs of those mud districts? So if anything, I don't know if it'll change the formation so much, but I think it'll force developers who, uh, who deficit fund these MUDs at the beginning to really take a hard line stance on, you know, what do we really need versus what we, what we, do, what we have done as a matter of habit and course. Mm -hmm. So is it quarterly board meetings? Is it, you know, Zoom meetings? Uh, lots of different things. So it just, it just forces us all to, to get better at every area of our business. I mean, I've, I've unturned every stone I have, on, I, I can on every project I have, you know, and gotten down into the weeds and details far deeper than I probably should be, but it's been eye-opening, figuring out ways where we can improve and get better. I think these kind of times bring all that out. What are your thoughts, Rich? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple couple uh, layers to your question. Uh, let me take, I think, the easiest one first. I think it's too early to, to, to say what the impact's gonna be on values and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the, the appraisal districts are, are setting out, uh, you know, the preliminary roles right now and, you know, values are way up across the board. So I think you're going to have a whole lot of protests on those values this year that you didn't see before because um, those values were determined before all this started, right? And so I think that's going to be, that's going to be something we're all going to have to navigate uh, through. But, you know, downturns like this, I think really highlight the, the, biggest strength of the mud model, which is all the rules are designed to make sure you don't have uh, uh, financial stress on those muds and defaults on bonds when you have a downturn like this. So, you know, I think this is going to be a good validation of the mud model as the superior model to do these uh, public infrastructure projects. 
you know, there's been a lot of talk in the last uh, several years about different models that are a little bit riskier, have fewer regulations. Um, and I think you'll see some of those, uh, uh, those alternative types of financings uh, around the state get into some trouble. And, and we'll see if that everybody still thinks they're such a good idea we can have a downturn like this. Um, they may be fine, but, but you know, the mud model is designed to handle this type of downturn without having uh, default risks to bondholders, which, which is, like I said, the, the part of the, the strength of the mud model. Uh, to Peter's point about operations, um, yeah, I, you know, I hope that that this opportunity brings everybody in the 21st century in terms of technology. Um, we've been very efficient and very effective at getting our board meetings done uh, remotely. You know, we've all gone to e-signature, which we should have done five years ago, but nobody had the impetus to do. Uh, that saves time, that saves messenger costs, that, those sorts of things. I mean, to, to Peter's point on these, these MUDs that are just getting started, you put a lot of consultant travel time, myself included, right? Which is, is money that you probably don't need to spend. So, you know, it will be uh, interesting to see what the legislature does uh, next year in terms of making some of these changes to the, uh, the way we can conduct these public meetings uh, virtually. If they make some of those permanent, I will tell you, I think that the online meetings like the one we're doing now give the public a better opportunity to access what's going on because they can just go in their living room, click on and see what's going on. All the documents are available. Um, and it's certainly, you know, once you kind of get over the hurdle of the setup, it is certainly cheaper. Right? So it saves the taxpayers money to run these, these districts virtually as opposed to the way we've been doing it for the last 30 years. So, you know, I think everybody in our industry uh, has an obligation to try to keep costs down. Uh, it, you know, it all goes to the, the, the taxpayer at the end of the day. And, um, and one of the things that Houston has always been known for is you can get a great big house for not a whole lot of money. Um, and uh, to Peter's point, I think everybody in the industry is, is trying to figure out how can I do uh, a better job and do it for less money than I did last year. And I think that'll be a good thing uh, in, on the long term. There's two, thing, two things, you know, as it relates to MUDs that I think uh, um, could easily have a spotlight put on the next legislative session um, to change. And that is two that I've always contended have just been crazy is not allowing electronic record keeping and the amount of money that we spend on, you know, storing files and paper files and MUDs and the amount of paper we generate for, you know, to, to the TCEQ and contracts, it's just, it's crazy. Um, and the other one is, is uh, the notification process having to be in newspapers and how archaic that is and coming up with, you know, electronic systems and, you know, and, you, know you know, tossing the newspaper lobby to the curb and tell, telling them that, sorry, <laughs> just because you have a power a lot we're not going to stop from doing this right now because it makes a whole lot of sense for the taxpayers well there's something that's also uh, near and dear to my heart that been i've been working on for the last decade and, and we've advanced it over time and that is electronic bid submission yep. uh, we're successful uh, several legislative sessions ago and in, in order to get that added to the sealed bid uh category or, or qualification um, but uh, but I, I'd really like to try and take this opportunity here to try and push that ball across the goal line to say just 100% electronic bid submission and do away with the uh, in-person bid openings and whatnot that just takes so much time and it's just so unnecessary with this. Yeah, I think I think you've seen that in the last two months. I mean, that, that oh, ability yeah. has been there for years, both, yeah. both technically and legally, and it was just – you know, too much, too much uh, objection to it because hey, that's just not the way we've we've always done it, right? And now people have been forced to do it. They go, oh, God, this is this is the right paper. <laughs> Don't yeah. it's uh, it's yeah, for no, it's, uh, it, it's you know, and, and and we see that even in our office. I mean, we we talked about you know, going to a product signatures years ago, yeah. um, and it wasn't until you had to do it. And then everybody goes, oh, this actually can be better and cheaper and faster. Um, you know, I, you, just, you had to have some incentive to do it, and, and this is it. So, 
There's, there's some silver linings to these black clouds for sure. There's some title companies that, that we've done business with that, that won't accept electronic signatures and won't notarize my signature. You know, yeah, those guys are going to have to. They're going to go out of business. business. They're yeah. going to they, 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 lose, they lose our business. It's gone. That's right. So that's right. You adapt that's or you will die. That's one of those. I think this, for sure. I think this time is a classic example of the necessity as the mother of invention. So these times bring out these uh, these creative things. As I say, uh, you know, as we've referred to many, y'all referred to several times in this podcast of you know it's the way it's been done for the last thirty years. That's that's why our core value number one is keep it fresh. Meant for that, and that is is that just because we've done it that way for the last thirty years doesn't mean that's the way it needs to be done or the way it should be done. So let's keep it fresh and, and, and let's think of new way, new ways to do things. So um, moving on, Rich, you, you mentioned uh, home sales. Uh, uh, Houston, the Houston region is, is one of the only places in the nation where you can come and buy a really big house for a, for a really good price. So how are sales trending? Uh, how, how are you seeing uh, home sales trending and, and how do you think this pandemic has impacted home sales? Well, that may, might be a better question for Peter, but there was one theory I heard the other day that I think is really interesting and, and I can't wait to see how it plays out. And that is, um, you know, going into 2020, the thought was, well, the millennials want to be in apartments and they don't want to be in houses and everybody likes that close in, you know, urban style of living. Um, I think what, what we're seeing and what I'm hearing is a lot of people who are looking to buy houses now are people with families that have a stable job and have the money for a down payment and have been thinking about getting out of an apartment. And now all of a sudden they're like, I don't want to be in an apartment complex that's, you know, with this virus going around because I'm just walking into, a, you know, a potential virus factor. So you're seeing people leave apartments to try to get into houses. You know, having your own home is the ultimate social distancing measure, right? Uh, and so I think you're you're seeing a lot of that trend, and, and that's been discussed. And I can't wait to see how the the data uh, uh, show that in the, the next few months. But I think you'll see a big move from apartments to houses. Well, as as, as the Waller County judge said in the last podcast we did, he says he, he he thought that social distancing was invented in in Waller County, so mm -hmm. spread yeah. out as that. Well. So yeah, so. Well, Pete, y'all are in the home building business. So how, what are you seeing? Uh, how, how is this national pandemic affecting home building on, on y'all's uh, front? Well, I mean, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. I think you're just going to see people delay decisions, you know, in the face of uncertainty. It's there, I mean, you know, consumers are no different than business owners in that regard. Um, and, and to the extent that it's not going to stop, it never does. Um, but I think people will probably be more prudent and maybe not reach as far as they did when, um, to buy that bigger house and um, in a better economy and, and with with less uncertainty. So I think you'll see the price point shift down. So I think it's just and develop as developers, we've been working on that and talking about that for years now about you know the affordability quotient in, in Houston and how to become more affordable. And, and I think the builders and you know us and other builders included have done a great job adapting and coming up with really good product on 40 foot lots. I mean, 40 foot lots 20 years ago in my career would have been something that we would never have dreamed of or thought of putting into a master plan community. And it's perfectly acceptable right now. Um, there's some great plans that builders have come up with for smaller lots. So, you know, I think that'll, that, that'll become, that, that'll become a trend that just gets accelerated. Um, yeah. So uh, you, you, you might have builders that have larger lots on the ground that look at uh, taking the section to the 70s and reviving them into 60 foot lots. So there might be some change that comes into that that just gets accelerated because of this. So back when uh, we bought our first house over 30 years ago, uh, we certainly didn't get into the market back when the rates were up in the in the high teens and low twenties. But we thought we had just crushed it when we got a mortgage for under 14 percent right. with with. with with interest rates, as I say, is free money these days for interest rates of, of t in the high twos, low threes. How do y'all see, uh, knowing that we're still in a national pandemic and things are slowing down, but man, mortgage rates are really low. Do you think that will have any kind of a, a bearing on, on home sales moving forward, even though things are, are really tight? Well, I hope so, because, you know, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about the pandemic stuff, but I mean, for Houston, obviously, 
the pandemic is secondary to oil and gas prices and what's happening in the you know oil and gas industry. And that's a much bigger concern for me than than the uh, coronavirus. Um, now good news is today, you know, uh, May 7th rolls up, I think 10%, so that's good. Um, and you know what, what we're hearing is is that oil companies have gotten really good at, at cutting people, and they're also going to be really good at bringing them back fast. I hope that's true. Um, but if if we don't have job growth in Houston, then the you know really the only chance we have to have home sales is people who are deciding they're going to move out of apartments, right, or move up, or something like that, or because interest rates are so low, which is what the you know, the Fed's trying to do, they can they can make a switch. Even in this, uh, you know, recession or whatever we're, we're headed for, so uh, I hope the low rates make a difference because uh, cause right now that's probably going to be our biggest driver. Uh, I would think, Peter, what do you think? You've got. I mean, the people that are out there are people who have stable jobs. That, that, and if you've got a stable job, um, I mean, and you're thinking about, or you're in the market to buy a house, you're not going to find a low rate in this probably, you know, forever, or at least for a while now. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely definitely a great driver, but it's going to keep um, a lot of the activity on the lower end of the spectrum. You know, there, there's also you know we have a couple um, several really high end communities um, of which we've recently sold some lots and some homes to people. But there's no financing involved, um, and so the, the people that I mean on that end of the spectrum, it's not it's not really a factor to them, and you know they're just they're going to make decisions in their life to just to enjoy what they have and you know if it's a home or, you know, whatever it's, they're going to spend the money. So it, uh, things don't stop. They never do. Uh, when you're up, it's never as good as you think it is. And when you're down, it's never as bad. That's right. Well, as I, as I said, uh, it, last I looked, I don't think that, uh, uh no, uh, I don't think the, the, the influx of folks wanting to move to the great state of Texas has stopped. It's still coming in. They're still going to need, they're still going to need homes. And, and my father, God rest his soul, for years and years, been been in it was in this business for fifty plus years. Always said he loved it when he saw the building uh, increase because he says those uh, today's apartment dwellers are tomorrow's home buyers. So and that will not yeah. be any more close to the truth. So so do we see any changes in homes that we that are gonna uh, the the designs and in in the construction any any changes as a result of this pandemic now that you've got you know the possibility of working from home is more of an option now is that going to have an impact on home designs do you think saw an article the other day um, an obvious one that was talking about how the the home office and home office spaces to the, in smaller homes are going to be more integrated into the house so you know thinking about out, you know, having, you know, husband and wife potentially working from home, you know, side by side, you know, it's not really very productive. One's sitting at the living room table and the other's sitting in the office. So, um, so I think there'll be a lot of, you know, uh, a heavier focus on the function of the home office. Uh, technology offerings, I think, will go up. I think you'll see things like, you know, you know, these um, mesh Wi-Fi repeaters, um, better hardline access access you know to to fiber i mean in the home so yeah there'll be there'll be some changes for sure rich are you seeing anything having to do you know w with that uh, trying to accommodate the 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 home office do you see anything like that in the communities that you're working with as the attorney that they're thinking of bringing in you know, more uh, robust uh, uh, internet broadband type stuff or anything of that nature yeah i have to see it yeah i think all that's a little early i mean again i go back to I kind of earlier, it depends on how much of this is temporary and how much of this is permanent. But but to Peter's point, one of the biggest challenges we've had with our folks that are working from home is most of our uh, folks have a have a spouse that's also working from home, and so you have two people crammed in a, a home office, or one at the living room table and one at the kitchen table, and and so um, you know I would think that there would be to the extent people are going to start working from home more, you would. See see a shift uh, to address that need. I mean, look, the great news is in Houston, we've got great builders everywhere, and they are really good at adapting quickly to the demands of the market. If the market demands something different, they will design something different, they will build something. And those guys are great at what they do. 
that's an easy thing to change too for builders. That's not like that's a you know two three year process. That's a that's a one month process. Here's a new plan. Here's a great plan with a dual study option. Yeah. Hey, but look, here's the real important thing on the internet, though. I need a separate internet for my kids' gaming. Right? I've heard a lot of and, that. And, oh, and social yeah. media and, and video for my for my network that, that I work on. Give me yeah. if we can keep those separate. I'm sure there's a way to do it. Uh, but but uh, that's the key is I can't have my you know, Call of Duty and Fortnite. You know, messing up my video conference. That's you have, you have to have a bandwidth allocation. And, and I think they have got that. I just, yeah. That's dirty. <laughs> I think. I mean, you hit on something. I mean, that's a that's a real that is a real thing. A I mean, real thing. Yeah, for sure. You may see dual dual uh, broadband services coming into a single home of kids with working parents because yeah. I mean these video chats, these video conferences. I mean, they all they they tag they 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 tax the system pretty pretty good. So well, and, and my kids only do video chat. I mean, they're all doing FaceTime or or something like that. I mean, they don't nobody puts the phone up in their ear and talks anymore. They're all doing this with you know, watching people do it. At the at the peak of this, when we had our, our our two children, my niece and Deb and I both at home, I would have to go up and tell them that like guys, during the middle of the day until five o'clock, get off Netflix because it's degrading yeah. my video quality. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I've heard that. So y'all mentioned a little while ago about uh, about the higher density. Uh, there's been speculation that because of the high, the, because of the highly contagious virus outbreak that that we've been going through, the culture of the higher density urban living might be impacted because of the reality that everyone is living in such close quarters. One would say, uh, you know, you're you're kind of living in a petri dish. So, do you both agree with that? You know, I don't think we're New York City from a density standpoint. Um, you know, you see people on the news in New York City playing to the, to the Hamptons. And um, so, I, I mean, the, the southern cities haven't been as dense as that. So I don't know if that would be as much of a trend in, in Houston. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, and the other thing is too, you know, people forget and uh, our, our memories are relatively short. Um, it always shocks me every time they pull up a uh, metro study, pulls up the, the slide on, you know, what happens to property values in areas that flood. And with within under two years, they've lost and, and, and basically returned whatever value they lost immediately after that period and has gone back up. It's like so people just forget. And and you know, and the coronavirus will be with us for a while and you know, and we'll figure out scientific ways to treat it and um and, and lessen its impact on our world. And I think people I mean, there might be a short term change in that in some markets. I don't know if it's huge so much um but long term i think people who want to live in urban areas are going to live in urban areas well i think there's two there's really two two different pieces to that question one is within houston are people going to move from from the core to the suburbs more um and i think that that really is a function of can they you know are their companies going to let them work from home so the commute is not as big an issue and all that sort of thing but but jim you made a point earlier about people Will still want to come to Texas, right? So, so the, the trend I'm more interested in, and, and some of the things I'm hearing are the people who are in New York or in the really dense cities are like, I don't want to be in a city this dense anymore. I'm going to move to Texas. Or people from California don't want to be in the big city anymore. They want to move to Texas where it is more spread out. Um, so, you know, both within Houston, do we see people moving out of the city center and, and in the suburbs, which would be a reverse of the trend we've seen over the last decade? I don't know. Uh, I do think the trend from the really dense cities like New York and Philly and that sort of thing, you might see more people move to the, to the less dense environments of Texas. We finally started to get the millennials out of those environments. It's so late in making you know, um, family decisions and getting, getting married later, and they're finally starting to move out to the suburbs. I think it might accelerate that to the extent that their employers allow them to work from home. Because one of the, one of the things I mean one of the things about living closer to town if it's for your job it's just a quality of life I don't spend an hour on the road you know commuting it's also going to I mean think about what it could do to change you know the congestion on our roads I mean there might be some road projects that just don't need to be done for the next ten years and when t 60 days ago they were like at peak capacity during time so 
you know, that, that could be a significant, significant saving to some of our, you know, our government, governmental budgets, which starting in 2021, if there's some property value decreases are going to be hit. Yeah, I, I think the key to all the, all these questions, Jim, goes back to the permanence of the work from home situation. And, and I think part of it is you'll see, in particularly the, the employees that are in high demand, you know, that'll just be a part of the negotiation from day one. They're not going to go work for a company that's not going to let them. Right. Right. And so the employers are going to have to adapt to that and allow that. And, uh, you know, and if you, so if you see even a 25% shift in people working from home, I think you see the movement to the, uh, to the suburbs increase and accelerate. Yeah. You know, again, as we've, as I think we've all recognized that the two big takeaways ways out of this this tragic pandemic that we're in is the work from home model that everyone kind of was a little afraid of prior to were forced into it and have determined that hey man this is kind of working pretty well yeah you know, it's done really well and then and then of course these video conferences that we talked about earlier so you hit on uh rich the the suburban areas of course um uh, it's it's been speculated that again because of the highly contagious virus outbreak, the suburban style community developments in the peripheral areas are going to continue to grow and probably become more popular uh, than they typically have. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Yeah, again, I think back to people working from home, and and if so, then then yeah. And, and look, Peter's point earlier, the the the. The master plan communities, there will always be a demand for that, right? That lifestyle that you can't get in just the typical subdivision development. Um, I think that's, you know, people love that. I mean, people love that with, with, with families. They, they, they love it with uh, friends. Um, you know, that sense of the community is a big deal for people. And, you know, the one, one thing that, that you keep hearing uh, over and over again is that I'm hearing over and over again is people are just tired of being cooped up in their house and they want to be with their friends, right? I mean, they want to be around people. Um, and so, you know, we're social, we're a social creature. I don't think any of that ever changes, right? There will always be a demand for that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't know that I have much to add to that. Yeah, you're, yeah, all, a lot of y'all's developments, Peter, are on the peripheral. So y'all are, y'all obviously uh, uh, believed in that thought process a long time ago. And this, uh, this is only kind of going to put, Going to, going to continue to prove that. So we talked about uh, uh, things that have been impacted in these communities, uh, broadband service, the water and sewer, and trash collections. One of the things that we didn't touch on that is very common uh, or, or it, it's becoming uh, or was very common, of course, beforehand, but has become even more common now, and that is home deliveries. How are you seeing uh, communities adapting to uh, more UPS, FedEx, and Amazon delivery trucks, and 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 how do you see that uh, incorporated in in home construction? Yeah, um, so we've got a, a, a couple multifamily projects right now that are under development. I think that multifamily has been ahead of the curve on this in terms of you know package um, receiving packages and cataloging packages. Um, so I think. The, the, the home building industry uh, is going to have to start coming up with plans and boxes and drop boxes and things like that. So I think that's going to accelerate that. Uh, similar to the, the discussion we had earlier about having multiple studies in the house and accommodating work from home. So um, the way it's been handled to date is generally stuff is left on people's porches. And I think, I think those businesses learned, learned that there's some shrinkage, as they call it, some stuff that's going to get stolen. They just deal with it and understand that's a cost of their doing business. But um, I don't know how long that will go on if, you know, if the delivery pace continues at its pace that it is right now, which is a lot. So um, builders will have to adapt. They'll have to come up with ways to, to do that. And it's, it's not that hard. And there's a lot of great solutions if you just look to the multifamily industry right now. And I can't believe we haven't seen the, the drop box uh, being integrated in the home door. I, I would just think that's got to come at some point. You know, uh, you've seen some of these things where, you know, they, they have the electronic key that lets you open your front door and leave a package or open your garage and leave a package. I don't think anybody's going to go for that long term. I think you've got to have a way to slide it into the house or slide it into some package receiving area and it, and it be safe and uh, not get access to the whole home. But the builders will figure that out. That 
But those guys are really good at, at adapting to the needs of the market. Yeah, we, we uh, as Pete knows, we're going through, uh, Stephanie and I are going through a, a whole house home remodel of our 55 year old house that we've lived in for 20 years. And it's probably about 10 years overdue, but uh, we finally pulled the trigger. And in a month after, after this, uh, after we started, this pandemic came uh, about and we were in the house looking at all the sheetrock on the floor, the insulation on the stairwell, the carpet down the hallway and whatnot. And I said, I looked at it, I said, well, we can't put it all back together now. So we're, we're committed. So one of the things that we're doing is expanding our garage. And uh, one of the things that we I picked up years ago from somebody, I can't remember who, uh, that we were, in fact, we were talking with a builder about yesterday is that we're building into that garage extension a delivery room that is going to be about a five foot by 10 foot room that's going to have a, a door exterior that will have a, 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 a common or a key punch lock on it. And it will have shelves, a, um, a, a clothes hanging rack and a refri small refrigerator with freezer so that those delivery people can come in, punch the code, drop the stuff off, hang up your cleaning, deliver your food or whatnot, and uh, and you can you can have it. And the builder that uh, that we're working with, he said, "Man, this is this is uh, this is a great idea." He, he, leave it he to an engineer. To, leave it to an engineer to solve the problem. I like that. Uh, awesome. so, can, you, can you send me the designs? Send, send me the details. I'm in. As I, tell, as I tell Stephanie, I said everything that we do. Man, we're doing this for resale, sweetie. We're doing it for resale. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one last question before we'll uh, before we'll kick off a lightning round uh, of of a couple of questions. So, uh, because uh, uh, you know we're truly blessed to be here uh, in Southeast Texas, which we all know is a growth oriented region. Tell me, both of you, where do you think the mud uh, uh, model as well as the future of res single family residential development. Where, where does it go post COVID-19? Any, any certain direction? Peter, you want you lead off on that? You know, it's, uh, we, we, I mean, kind of haphazardly, we've hit a, upon a lot of the things over just some of the earlier questions, but, you know, I think we continue to streamline the mud process and, and make it leaner and more efficient. I think there's been a spotlight put on some of those things that need to be cleaned up. I hope we'll take this opportunity to get our legislators to help, help us clean, clean some of it up. Um, the, the development model, I think, will be uh, more heavily focused on smaller product, smaller single family detached product, um, heavier focus on more outdoor amenities, um, walking trails, and, and an even bigger spotlight on something we've known for a long time. Um, uh, you know, I think some construction costs will come down, I think, as, as we've started to see here recently, which will give some relief to some of the, the pressures we've had on, um, on affordability in our region, which is kind of new to Houston. That hasn't been a thing for, for quite some years in Houston, Texas. So I think um, a lot of those things will ch change, but um, you know, the, the, the right neighborhoods and the right school districts um, will continue to drive growth. In a city like Houston, outside of new job growth, I mean, you've grown by 50,000 people a year just from the, you know, the birth and de the death rate within the city of Houston. So um, we're 7 million people in our MSA, and that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a big, it's a big market. So um, I think we'll focus and fine tune a lot of things and, you know, we'll have, a, I think, a happier workforce. Um, I think the quality of life will improve from our, with, with our workforce, allowing them to work from home and not spend as much time on the roads. Um, and so it'll, uh, I think we'll just kind of chisel away and refine what, what we've been doing and make it better. Rich, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said earlier, I think what you'll see is if, if you hit, hit a rough patch here, uh, there'll be an indication of the mud model as the you know, financing standpoint and all the rules and feasibility requirements before we issue bonds uh, that were put in place as a result in the 80s, you know, those will get tested again. Um, and and if we pass the test, which I think we'll do, uh, and everybody go, oh, that's, that's a really good way to do things. Um, and I think that the same part of the, that is, is that I think to Peter's point, you know, we've had a really good run since, since 2008 uh, and we've all gotten complacent in how we do things. And I think this will be an end to the complacency. Um, I think everybody will take a fresh look at how they do things. Um, 
and and try to figure out how to deliver, you know, a highly house in a great community for an affordable price. And and everybody's got a role to play in in uh, revamping the system, bringing down costs where we can, and adjusting to the market conditions so that that continues to be one of the big drivers of people coming here is they can get a great house for a great price. And, you know, that, that's all on us. I mean, we can control that. We can't control coronavirus. We can't control the price of oil. But as an industry, we can control how we do our jobs and, and how we go about our business um, so that, that we deliver, as an industry, the, the best product for the best price we can. I mean, that's, our, that's our mission. I, I look forward to the challenge. I think it's a great challenge, and I think that, that it will be, be interesting, and I think that people will adapt to the changes, and it will be great. I think we'll, we'll come out of this better and stronger. Yeah, I think that's a that's a common theme that that uh, we're all going to be better as a result of uh, what we've just gone through, as it is with an, each time we go through times like this. So, so, um, well, Houston is a is, is the Houston region is a very affordable uh, market, and we need to uh, do everything we can as 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 leaders in our industries to to continue to keep it that way. So. All right, brings us to our lightning round. All right, uh, let's go. Right. These, 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 are, are, these are unannounced questions. These are, are these are unannounced questions. So y'all understand what the lightning round means. And we'll go by the Michael Berry model. So it's a one answer quick uh, question. So what Go we'll ahead. do is Pete, we'll, we'll start off with you first and go to Rich. Rich, then we'll go from you to Pete and back and forth. There's four Perfect. questions. Are y'all ready? Yep. Lightning round. All right. Will it be will there be college football this year? Yes. Yes. Who will win the national championship? Texas A and M. LSU. <laughs> will Texas A and M beat LSU this year? Yes. <laughs> Last question. According to 27, 27, uh, 24-7 sports. Who ranked higher in the top, uh, top 10 college quarterbacks for the decade of 2010 through 2019? Joe Burrow or Johnny Manziel? Johnny Manziel. Ooh. Say it again. Ask the question again. According to – We have to answer along party lines, Jim. Who ranked higher in the top 10 college quarterbacks for the decade of 2000 through 2019? Joe Burrow or Johnny Manziel? Wow. So it's obviously a trick question. And since I know you're an Aggie, Jim, I'm going with Johnny Manziel. You're both correct. It uh, Number one, just to, just to give you the, the lineup, number one is Cam Newton. Number two is Baker Mayfield. Three uh, is Johnny Manziel. Right. Four is Deshaun Watson. Five is Lamar Jackson. Six is Joe Burrow. Uh, seven is Trevor Lawrence. Eight is uh, Tua Taglavoa. Nine is Jamie Swinston, and ten is Kyler Murray. So that's interesting. So, I actually thought would have thought Burrow would have been above Johnny. Well, it, I, probably the, the two-year average probably brought him down. If it, it's yeah. just one year, I, I'd go with Joe. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the deal is is that is that Joe is a four-year period. Johnny was was a two-year. So just yeah. the stats. Um, uh, passing uh, Joe Burrow, six hundred nineteen out of. Uh, 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 896, so a 69.1 completion average for a total of 83, 89 yards, 73 in, uh, touchdowns, and 11 interceptions, whereas Johnny was an 68.9% uh, with 7,800 total yards and 63 touchdowns. So, But where Johnny, of course, you know, his numbers were close to Joe. Joe took him on the numbers, but it was just over a two-year period. But Johnny, uh, uh, Joe was obviously a pocket passer, and Johnny was a scrammer, so – Joe has a total of uh, 763 rushing yards, and Johnny had almost 2,200. Yeah. So. Well, look, I think we can all agree they were both fun guys to watch. Um, oh, wow. Uh, and, and, very, uh, very entertaining guys to watch. There's no question about it. So. And, I, and I'll still tell you, watching Johnny Manziel going into Alabama and beating Alabama his, uh, his freshman year, sophomore year, was there was nobody cheering for him harder than Rich Muller for that game, I promise you. Uh, it was – that 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 one will go down in history as one I will not forget. Well, and, and the NMLSU game is another one. Oh, the seven overtimes. Oh, yeah. Classic. 
So, yep. all right, gentlemen. Well, hey, yeah, thank, thank you again. For, thank you again for doing this. This was fantastic. Really appreciate the opportunity. Well, we appreciate you guys taking time to do this. It was a lot of fun. So we appreciate that. And we were, we, we, we're, uh, we're always looking for ways to, uh, again, better, uh, better the industry and, and give back. So uh, everybody out there, please look forward to uh, some future podcast uh, 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 series from EHRA Engineering called The Ground Down. So again, gentlemen, thanks again for your time. Y'all have a great rest of the day. Y'all have a good weekend and uh, we'll see y'all soon. We hope that you have enjoyed today's episode. If you would like to hear more episodes of The Ground Down, please visit www.ehrainc.com for updates. Make sure to check out EHRA Engineering on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube for all kinds of cool content. 